these things that we've been discussing. Uh, God has given me a renewed commitment to uh, to let his strength be my strength in the face of temptation and uh, a renewed vigor, I think, to not give in and uh, to let God win those victories. And so I hope that's been the case for you as well. Uh, last time, two weeks ago now, we looked at the at consequences and temptation. And we saw that one of the ways to stay strong when you're confronted with temptation, one of the ways to not give in is to be mindful and to be acutely aware of all that's at stake. Because whenever sin is indulged in, whenever sin is committed, whenever we yield to the temptation, we, we're weak and we give in, we always lose something. Sin always, always, always takes something from us. Sin always has a cost. It always exacts a cost on our lives. And so if we're aware of that, uh, when the temptation is presented, uh, all that we might lose, all, all that hangs in the balance over this decision, that's going to help us face it well. That's going to help us stay strong and not give in to the temptation as we realize what the cost is. And so uh, that's what we talked about last time. Tonight, our title is Escaping Temptation. Escaping Temptation. And our text here in 1 Corinthians 10 includes one of the maybe more well-known verses in all of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, and that is a, a verse that's often learned in Sunday school class and learned in Christian schools. And I don't know if, I don't know if he's watching on the live stream, but Brother Clifford Maddie, if you've gotten around Brother Clifford Matty, you have heard 1 Corinthians 10, 13 quoted. And Brother Clifford, if you're watching, that's a compliment to you. There's two verses. There's some people that I just associate with certain verses. Galatians 2, 20 is a Clifford verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a Clifford verse. But, but they're for all of us, but just some people that really love Verses that I think of, but let's read 1 Corinthians 10. We'll read the first 14 verses of this chapter. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. <laughs> Amen. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples of the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all of these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, uh, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And here's the big verse here. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage that informs us of something so important, or something that, uh, that you have done for us because you are faithful. We want to uh, be, be helped by this passage. We want to apply it. We want to let you uh, have your way in our lives as a result of our time spent uh, studying and considering and letting these your words into our hearts and minds. Be present with us here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Escaping temptation. Number one tonight, no one is exempt. No one is exempt. As far as escaping temptation, this verse tells us uh, in, in 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Common to man. And so nobody is exempt from it. Nobody is above it. Uh, there is not a degree of Christian maturity that a believer can reach that, you know, you have gotten to the end of the video game, you've conquered all the obstacles, and you have now arrived, and now you're above. Now, now you know, that's what Hinduism teaches. You've reached nirvana, and now you're not tempted by anything. You're perfect. Uh, no, we, we, we will not. There is no degree of holiness. There is no degree of... Christian maturity that will get us to the place where we're, we're safe 
and immune and free and clear from, from ever being tempted by sin again. Where we, we just kind of hit sinlessness and, and nothing lures us, nothing draws us, nothing nothing that's wrong is, is ever presented to us that, that we want. We'll never get there. As long as we're on this side, uh, on this side of heaven, on this side of the rapture, as long as you're in flesh, <laughs> as long as you're living in flesh and it's fallen flesh, there will be pull from the flesh. There will be a, a pull and there will be strength to the, the pull of the lust of the flesh. And so it's, it's something that is common to man. And the reason that's important is because one of the ways that the flesh tries to get you to justify partaking of sin is to get you and to get me to think that we're special, to think that our situation is different. We'll say, well, but my case is unique. I've had this happen to me. Or my situation is a little different. My circumstances are a little special. And God knows all about it. And so because my situation and my life and what's happened and because of the way things have how the way things have fallen out and unfolded in my life, well, so God knows all that and he understands all that. So he knows that for me, it'll be all right if I do this. It'll be all right. And, and so I'll just go ahead and partake because after all, um, things are a little different with me. We tell ourselves, when, when we say that, when, and you know, we've all done that. We've all thought, well, but, but my case is different. And, and, and what we're doing when we say that is that, you know what, my temptation is uncommon. It's, it's just me. It's just my, it's my own unique situation. It's uncommon, and it, it's just mine. But God says, no, it's not. It's common to man. But whatever it is that you most struggle with, Whatever your toughest weakness is, whatever your weak point is in the flesh, whatever, uh, like we've said before, there's thousands of sins and we're, we each have different ones that uh, have more power over us that we're more drawn to. And so whatever one that it is for you, um, let me tell you tonight that you're not the only one. And your flesh wants you to think you are, but you're not the only one. There are others that struggle with it too. And many others and those who share the same weakness with you, you know, you look at you're in that group, and that that particular sin is attractive to everybody in that group, and not one person in that group is an exemption from God's direction to forsake that sin. No one in that group, not you or not anyone else that struggles with it, gets an exception and gets an exemption from the requirement to abstain from that sin. But we'll say, Lord, you don't understand what Satan did to me. Mm. Lord, you don't understand what Satan's doing to me. It's unlike the others. It's, it's different with me. My, I'm an anomaly, and my situation is unusual. And, and so, you know, what, he, what, he's doing, what Satan is doing to me is not what he does to other people. And we'll say that. And really what we're trying to do is to say, well, my sin is more understandable. There, it's a rationale. It's an excuse. It's a, well, not, what I want to do ought to be more permissible because of my unique circumstances. Sure. And because what Satan's doing, he, he really is singling me out. And so I should get some pity because I'm being singled out because he's really being unfair with me. He doesn't do this to everybody else. And we're trying to get permissiveness to go ahead and do it. And God says, no, it's common to me. The devil doesn't reserve any of his tricks or methods for just one individual. If, if the devil's doing it to you, you can bet he's doing it to somebody else. He's doing it to somebody else too, and so we can't just say, well, my case is different. Now, let me say that we are each special to God. Uh, we, uh, what I just said doesn't take away from the fact that every person, all 7 billion people walking this earth are different. And God creates and designs every person different. Uh, we can get to, to 50 billion people in the, on this earth, and they'll all be a little different. That's a testament to the glory of God and how uh, God's creative genius uh, in his design of each individual, everybody is a little bit different. And because we're all a little bit different, we're all special. He loves man individually. He loves, God loves mankind, but he loves us individually. And we 
come into a relationship with him individually. He loves us as individuals. He knows us and loves us as individuals. And all the things that make you different from other people, God knows all about them. He didn't do that. And, he, and so I'm not taking away from that, but you're not special to the devil. You're special to God, but to the devil, to Lucifer, to the tempter, to the wicked one, you are just another number. You are just a pawn. He just wants to use you in his scheme against God, and he doesn't care about you. God appreciates what makes you special and different because he made you that way. The devil's not your creator. The devil didn't make you special and different, so the devil doesn't appreciate your differences. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about you at all. He just wants to use you. So some may read this passage and say, well, but some of these sins don't really apply to me. I mean, verse 8 talks about fornication. Uh, there may be some in, in, in the faith that would say, well, you know, that might have been something that was a stumbling block and a struggle and a weakness for me, maybe back in my younger years, but now maybe perhaps I'm advanced a little bit in age, and so that's not something that's uh, really a, a problem for me anymore and not something that really draws me so much anymore. There's other stuff in this chapter that does apply to you. <laughs> you know, it talks about uh, idolatry there. And it says in verse 7, neither be idolaters. Well, I don't bow down and worship a box, and I don't bow down and worship Ashtaroth or Molech or, or the Buddha. Yeah, but Colossians tells us that covetousness is idolatry. You ever covet anything? <laughs> Every day, probably. We, we want things that don't belong to us that... that uh, we, we don't have any business walking. <laughs> uh, and so covetousness certainly is common to man. It applies to all of us. Uh, it talks in verse 10 about murmuring. Neither murmuring. Uh, I don't know anyone. That's, that's exempt. Of the, ah, it's not a problem for me. I am a, I'm a never murmur. I, I don't have any, you know, I never murmur and never will. I've conquered murmur. There's none of us that can say that. Uh, verse 6 talks about lusting after evil things. That's pretty general, isn't it? <laughs> that encompasses a whole lot of stuff. What Christian has gotten to the place where they've said, they can say, truthfully say, you know, all of my desires, all of the things that I want are perfectly proper and holy and correct and, and perfectly appropriate and biblical, and I've never, I don't have any want or lust or problem after anything that's wrong. None of us can say that. It's common to man. And so this whole chapter points back to the many spiritual failures of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. And what's, what's being conveyed in this chapter is that all of those spiritual failures from Israel wandering in the wilderness that are mentioned here, that are listed, that's quite a diverse array of, <laughs> of sins, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's eclectic. They, they were a well-rounded people in their dabblings into sin. Their forays into sin, it wasn't just matters of intimacy and physical, uh, marital type of things. It was all kinds of stuff. That, it was a lot of different things. It, their, their sins encompassed a broad range of different failures before God. And, and as God's people, and many thousand years later, we can, we can relate to that. It's a, it's a, a wide range of sin that is offered to us, and if it's, boy, if it's not one I struggle with, then it's another, and, and it sometimes it seems like just when you get victory over one, it's like whack-a-mole, and another one pops up in your life, and, and there's all kinds of things that can draw us because it's common to man. Nobody uh, is an exception to this. Number one, no one is exempt. Number two, there is always a way out. There is always a way out. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it, that you may be able to bear it. God may always makes a way to escape. When sin is presented to you and offered to you, God always makes a way to escape. I love the word escape in the Bible. Uh, God made a way for me to escape hell. I'm glad there's flames that I've escaped already. That's a beautiful word in Scripture. Hebrews 2 talks about that. How shall they escape that neglect so great salvation? How shall they escape hell and perdition and Christless eternity if they neglect so great salvation in him? But it's not just an escape from hell that God offers us. 
It's also an escape from the sins that tempt us that he offers us. So I'm, I've escaped hell already, but every day God makes for me a way to escape the sin that the tempter brings in my life, a way to escape the temptation. God is so against us sinning <laughs> that he always provides an alternate option. That's how against sin he is. That's how much God hates sin. That's how badly God wants us not to sin. If he was just kind of okay with it, he wouldn't go to such trouble to always furnish another option. <laughs> but, but he is so against our sinning, and he's so invested and so interested in our not sinning that he always provides us re- he always provides us with a different choice, with an alternate option, so that we may never have to say, well, I had a choice. I had to do this. 1 Corinthians 10.13 proves definitively that it will never, ever, ever, ever be God's fault when I say When I give in, I can never blame it on him. He made a way to escape. When I give in, it's because of me. It's not because of him. I can never get to the place where I say, well, I just have a choice. You know, I, there was only one meal that was offered, so that's what I had to take. No, he, there's always a second choice, and it's there somewhere. And that's why 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is so often memorized and quoted. And that's why it's just a great verse for children to get a hold of. And that's why it's a famous verse in Scripture, because it removes the blame for sin from God and puts it squarely on us. And that's, that's biblical, and that's truth. God's provision of a way for us to escape temptation flows from his faithfulness. That's what it says there. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Why does he make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it? Because he is faithful. It's that attribute of our God, his faithfulness, that causes him to make a way for us to escape temptation and the sin that's being offered to us that flows from his faithfulness. Think about that. I ought to be faithful to him, and you ought to be faithful to him, and you are, and that's why you're here. But I can only be faithful to him by taking advantage of the way, when, when sin comes my way and is offered, I need to be faithful to him and not do it. The only way that I can abstain from that sin is by taking advantage of the way to escape that God has made for me, and he's made that way to escape for me because he is faithful. And so you put all that together, and what it tells us is that any faithfulness of mine to him is owed entirely to his faithfulness to me. You can only be faithful to him because he's already faithful to you. It is God's faithfulness that enables and allows us to be faithful to him. Faithful means 100% reliable in this, in this passage. Think about that. If I am tempted to sin 10,000 times, God will not make a way to escape 9,999 times. Or one time or 20 times. If I'm tempted to sin 10,000 times, my God will make a way for me to escape 10,000 times. It's always 100% because he's faithful. His faithfulness never fails. And don't you see that as you read through scripture? And If you're doing your Bible reading, if, you're, if you've never read through the whole Bible before, let this year be the year that you do it. It's only February. You've got time to catch up or, or start now and plan to finish February 2022. But as you read through your Bible, man, pay attention to times when man falls. And I promise you, if you look for the way that they could have escaped, whenever man butchers it and messes up and falls and, and yields to sin and forsakes God and, and does wrong, you'll find there's a way to escape in there somewhere every time. You, you'll say, man, he could have just done this. She could have done this instead. God made the way. And that's true in our lives as well. And that goes for every kind of sin, including murmuring. <laughs> and so because it flows from his faithfulness, what that means is that when God makes a way, when sin is offered to you, and then God offers me another choice, that, wow, okay, there's a way, there's my, there's my escape, there's a way out, I don't have to do it, I can do this instead. If I bypass the escape, if I ignore and decline the escape, and I choose the sin instead, I've just denied his faith. Not only have I become disobedient, but I've denied his faithfulness. That's what verse 13 says. Isn't it? It's out of his faithfulness that he makes the way to escape. So if I don't want the way to escape, I've just denied his faithfulness. Every, with every sin we commit, 
we declare that God isn't faithful. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that he is. He is faithful. When we claim there was no way to escape, nope, I had no choice, there was no other route, I had to do what I did, we're undermining his faithfulness. We're attacking his faithfulness when we do that. There's a phrase that you hear that I think is well-intentioned, but at least word for word, it's not biblical. And maybe you've heard this before. God will never give you anything that you can't handle. God will never give you anything that you aren't able to handle. And it's not true. And, and it's usually loosely based on this verse. And because they'll say, well, there's no temptation taken you, but such, such, such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. See, you're able, so you can handle it. So he won't give you anything you can't handle. And so that's kind of how they loosely base that phrase on that verse. And it does say that he won't uh, suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But who is our enabler? Why am I able? Because of him. He is the enabler. He is the able one, not me. If I'm able, it's only because he is. Uh, our sufficiency is of God, the Bible says. Jesus said, without me, he can do nothing. And so he is our enabler. And so... The problem with that phrase, that God will never give you anything that you can't handle, is that it places the burden of bearing that temptation squarely on our shoulders. We've got to now handle it ourselves. When really, that's not what the passage is teaching at all. It's God who's faithful. Uh, and so he is faithful, 2 Peter 2, 9. It is God who knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. 2 Peter 2 9. It is God who knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And so, maybe a more accurate way to rephrase that, that quote would be that God will never give you anything that He can't handle. <laughs> and, and that's everything. <laughs> There's nothing that God can't handle. That's anything uh, and everything that comes your way. He is able to handle it. God is so faithful to righteousness that the way that He makes for us to escape will never be a different sin, ever. There, you're tempted to sin. God's faithful. Hey, Drew, have this. And but God says, nope, here's your recourse. Here's your other choice. This other choice that God has made, this way to escape, will never be just a different sin, just a lesser sin. And that's how some people justify. They say, well, well, yeah, uh, I did this sin over here, and I'm guilty of that, but it's only because it's a little bit less sinful than that other one. And so really, I did the right thing because I didn't commit the big one. I committed the little one instead, and those were my only two choices. God never works that way. The, the way to escape that he makes is never just a different sin. Psalm 119 and verse 170 says, deliver me according to thy word. He delivers the godly out of temptation according to his word. God will never make a way out that is unbiblical. The way out that he makes is always going to be scriptural. And so if there's a, a way that maybe presents itself as another choice, if it involves another sin, it's not from him. It's not from him. So when you're tempted, when temptation does come your way, you got to look for that way to escape. If God is faithful to always provide it, you got to look for it. Sometimes we don't want to see it. Sometimes he makes it and we're going, I don't see it. I guess i got to just do it. Well, i got to lift my head up and look for it. Because God said he'll make it, but sometimes I want what it's offering. So, well, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't see any way to escape. you got to look for it. Scanning, looking, probing, praying, Lord, where is your faithful? Lord, where is your way out? I'm bold and I'm interested, but God, I'm claiming 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You are faithful. Lord, make it. What is the way? And then, so no one is exempt. Uh, number two, there's always a way out. Lastly, number three. The way out is often to flee. The way out is often to flee. Verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Hold on. Flee. In the sense of spiritual warfare, in the sense of our struggle with the devil, in all the spiritual warfare that rages in our lives, of course, when we're talking about our conflict with the wicked one, we're never told to flee. <clears throat> Uh, we're told to resist the devil, and he will flee from us, right? And so we've talked about that with regard to spiritual warfare. 
We don't have to run away and hide. Uh, we have the sword. It's an offensive weapon. We resist the devil. He'll flee from us. But in the sense of our physical proximity to the place where sin is offered, which is a different question, we absolutely are told to flee. We don't flee from the devil. He'll flee from us when we resist him. But with regard to the, the place where sin is proffered, where sin is offered, where sin is uh, is presented to us, we are told to flee from there. To, to, and that's no coincidence there in verse 14, flee from idolatry. That admonition to flee is not a coincidence that agrees with those scriptures. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us flee fornication. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says flee also youthful lusts which war against the soul. This says flee from idolatry. And so with regard to the location where it's offered, we are to flee. Perhaps the most notable example in the Bible of a man being presented with an opportunity to sin, but looking for the way out, availing himself of the way to escape, would be Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. Joseph, what a story. Joseph had been sold to Potiphar, and Joseph had been faithful in all of Potiphar's house, and Joseph had been promoted, and he had been elevated, and committed unto Joseph was all of the affairs of Potiphar's house, and Joseph was the high-ranking decision-maker. He was trustworthy, and Potiphar said, Joseph, everything that you do is blessed, and I trust you, and, and you, you do right, and you're honest, and so I'm going to give you control of the house and, and control to oversee the affairs. But Potiphar's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Lie with me. And Joseph understood that's sin and that's wrong. And my master Potiphar kept nothing back from me. But how dare I uh, partake of this opportunity that's being offered to me by Mrs. Potiphar. And Joseph understood that it was wrong and it was sinful, not just because she was already Potiphar. Joseph understood and was aware that it would have been wrong and it would have been sinful even if she was a single lady because she wasn't Joseph's wife. And so he understood that he, even if she wasn't Potiphar's wife, I still ought not to do this because I'm not married to her. And it would only be proper and it would only be right if that relationship was a marital relationship. And so he understood that. But surely it was tempting. Surely it was tempting it's highly improbable and unlikely that the wife of such a high-ranking official in Egypt would have been a person who was just kind of unappealing to the eye, just kind of not a whole lot uh, to look at. More than likely, uh, the sight of her did present uh, a temptation. But the Bible says Joseph refused. He said this, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So, all right, he's been strong and he's... Let God win and, and praise the Lord, but the battle's not over. <laughs> but she, nevertheless, she persisted, to quote uh, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> uh, she spake to Joseph day by day, but he hearkened not unto her. Day by day. We just sang day by day. It means something a little different there in the song. And she just keeps crying and persisting. And so there comes a day when there's nobody else in the house but she and Joseph. And she corners him, and she traps him, and she gets him, and she puts him in a spot, boy. And he's going, man, Lord, what's your way to escape? Where is it? And she gets a hold of his garment, and she says, lie with me. But God did make a way to escape. And here's what it says. But Joseph fled. Joseph fled and got him out. He fled. The way of escape was to flee. Flee from idolatry. Flee also youthful lusts which war against the soul. Flee fornication. Go. Get out of there. Run. Go away and don't be there in that place anymore. Flee. So when the Holy Spirit uses the word flee, in 1 Corinthians 6, flee fornication. In 1 Corinthians 10, flee idolatry. In 2 Timothy 2, flee also youthful lusts. It's a call back to Joseph. Joseph fled. It's saying, handle it the way Joseph did. It doesn't mean you're running from the devil. It means you're, you're fleeing from the sin that's being offered. You're, you're relocating. You're getting out of it. That's the, often the way to escape is to flee. And there are two things that the word flee indicates. The, uh, the word flee indicates urgency, and the word flee indicates relocation. And I want to cover those two briefly, and then we'll be finished. 
The word flee indicates urgency. Notice that chapter 10, verse 14 doesn't say to saunter away from idolatry. It doesn't say to mosey away from idolatry. Uh, Joseph in Genesis 39 didn't, didn't stroll away from Potiphar's life. He didn't putz down the road away from Potiphar's life. He fled. He ran. He, he realized this is urgent. It, it says he fled. We're told to flee. Um, that is often a term that's used in police reports. You ever hear that a, a crime has taken place and somebody's been attacked and officers arrived in the scene and the suspect fled from the scene? Uh, they didn't mosey. They didn't saunter. The perpetrator that, that did the crime wasn't going to just kind of putz down the street uh, hoping that law enforcement doesn't arrive too quickly. They, they, there's urgency. They run. They don't want to get caught. They flee. And so that means fast with speed and urgency. Now, sometimes, especially men with our masculine ego and pride, we can get it in our heads that fleeing is always coward. Because it's been pumped into us so much that well, you don't ever run from a bully and you're just supposed to stand up to what's wrong. And David stood up to Goliath and David didn't flee from Goliath. And so, it's all, and so, and so we stop distinguishing between situations and we lose our discernment and we say, I'll never run, I'll never flee, I'll always just go toward it. But God says there are some cases where we ought to flee. And it doesn't mean we're cowardly. It doesn't mean we're running away from a bully. Uh, it means that What's about to happen it is destructive and explosive like a bomb. And if you think of a bomb going off, if you're in a room and there's a bomb that's got, just like in the movies, it's got 10, oh, red numbers, 10, 9, in the way you know this whole place is going to blow, it's not cowardly to run. It's wise to run. It's not cowardly to flee. It's wise to flee. That doesn't make you a kind. It's not a bully. It's a bomb. And that's what sin is, and that's what the situation with Potiphar's wife was. And Joseph wasn't spineless because he fled. Joseph fled because that was the godly thing to do, because if he had partook of what she was wanting to do, that would have been destructive in everybody's life, destructive in her life and Joseph's and Potiphar's. And so there's urgency there. Boy, if a bomb's about 10, 9, 8, you're not going, eh, I think I'll just... No, you're right. You're going to die. You're going to sprint. You're going you're gonna to get moving faster than you've moved in a long time. So when, when that sin comes, there's got to be urgency to get away from it. But not only does it indicate urgency, it also indicates relocation. Flee. Flee means to go somewhere else. One of the three primary areas of temptation, as we've talked about, is the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. This is especially true of men, and it's especially true of men in situations like that with Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Men are more visual. Men are especially susceptible to visuals, and it's often the attractiveness of the visual that brings our weakness in the flesh. A great other Bible example, that is Samson. Samson clearly had issues with women in Judges 16, 17. Uh, it says that Samson went down to Timnath and saw there a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He saw her. And then he'd get her for me. She pleases me well. His temptations and it had to do with what he saw. And he was especially uh, subject to weakness with regard to what he saw. Fleeing solves that. Relocating solves that. When you flee, you change your location. And when you change your location, you change your scenery. You're seeing different things. And the Bible says that my eye affected my heart. And if I get my eyes off of what I want so bad, and if I get a change of scenery, that's going to affect my thinking. Uh, and that's important. Uh, that's one of the benefits of fleeing and relocating. Think about Eve in the garden. We've talked about her a little bit, uh, that God uh, always makes a way to escape. And the serpent, Lucifer, in the garden offered Eve this forbidden fruit, and we've already covered a couple. God made a number of ways of, to escape. She didn't have to do it. And we've covered some of them in this series before. One of the ways that she could have escaped that temptation is she could have used the word of God. Remember, Jesus got victory over temptation with the word of God, and even though it wasn't printed and in writing, Eve could have said, thus saith the Lord, not this tree. She could have said, that's what God said. I'm not eating fruit of that tree because God's word that he verbally gave told me not to. She could have done that. Uh, another one that we've covered before is that she could have been thankful and content for all of the other trees. She could have said, 
Well, you know, servant, thank you for the offer, but I'm having, I really like mango. And I'm having mango for lunch today. And this tree over here in this part of the garden, that's my favorite. And I'm really excited about, oh, we're going to have some blackberries today. And they just, that's what I want for lunch today. And that's my plan. So no, thank you, servant. I'm not interested in fruit from that tree uh, that I'm forbidden. I'm, I'm interested in all of the delicious fruit from all the other trees that God has told me I can have freely. So she could have done that. But let me give you a third way to speak. Let me give you a third alternate choice that God offers that she could have taken. She could have simply fled. She could have relocated. Talk about a tree. A tree is planted. A tree it has roots. A tree is stationary. I don't think the serpent stretched forth a hand and brought it and followed her around. There's no indication in Genesis 3 that they, they changed locations. She could have just walked away. She could have just ran away. She could have just gone to a different part of the garden. Remember that one of the ways that she was tempted by was that she saw that it was good for food. It looked good. She could have changed her scene. She could have relocated and gone somewhere else and not stared right at that delicious looking piece of fruit. She could have changed her visuals. That old adage is often true, out of sight, out of mind. And there's often some, some good advice there. And so what's the application for us? Um, again, there's a thousand different ways to sin, but perhaps what's uh, attracting us is some person, uh, some individual who's not our spouse, and some situation of infidelity that's presented to us. You know what you do? You just get away from that person. So they're not in your line of vision. Get away, flee. Go like Joseph did. Go someplace else. Maybe it's your cell phone. Maybe it's the internet. Maybe it's material that's available uh, over the internet. When, when temptation comes, get away from it. Yeah. Just go for a walk. Just leave the house. Change your visuals and let the new things that you see change your thought patterns and change them to something that praises God and glorifies God. Uh, it's a little bit of fresh air and relocation will help tremendously, even if it's murmuring that most, tempt, that most tempts you. Even if it's a complaining and, and discontent spirit that tempts you the most, when you're feeling especially down and complaining, get up and go somewhere else. And you might see something else, that uh, change, a change of scenery that, that gets your mind on something good that God has done for you. That'll help you not complain and murmur when you see the goodness of God. Just change your environment. Change the atmosphere. Change what you see. And that's one way to address the lust of the eyes. <laughs> Someone said this, when you flee temptation, just be sure you don't leave a fork. <laughs> Don't, don't run and say, but find me here. I'll catch up with you somewhere else. No, flee means uh, getting away, getting away completely. And so I hope that's helpful to you. No one is exempt. It's common to man. We're not a, a special case that allows us to do it. There is always a way out because God is faithful. And the way out is often to flee. Relocate, change your view, change your thinking like Joseph did. Have urgency to it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, help us at times in our lives when